Hey everybody. Happy Sunday evening. It is um uh, it's 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 autumnal. It's positively autumnal in southeast Georgia. And I have to tell you, it has been a hard week on a lot of different fronts, and we're gonna get to that in a second, but um uh, Man, is it nice to be out on this porch and, and be in flannel and drink whiskey and hang out with you all. I appreciate you being here um, so much. Uh, this week, this week, this week was a punch in the face, man. It really, really was. And, um, you know, I, I, I said this um when I started this whole thing, which whatever this is, hanging out on Sundays and drinking bourbon and talking about what's going on. You know, I said that um, I wasn't I wasn't going to beat around the bush. I was going to talk about when things were hard. Um, things are hard. Things are hard. Um, I think there's still hope. I think there's a couple of things um, that, <laughs> surprise, surprise, uh, our media has not done a great job of really breaking down in terms of uh, what's going on. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Supreme Court, obviously. Uh, but before we do, I would be remiss if um, if we didn't take a second to uh, remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I think one of the sad truths about what's going on is that we get so caught up in um, chess moves and who wins this, who won that, you know, who, who won this, this latest day or who won, you know, this cycle or whatever. Um, you know, we have a, you know, we have an opening on the Supreme Court and we have something to fight about now. But um, it would be a mistake to not remember that a really great American died this week. Uh, lived a really long, inspiring life, and um, was a, a champion not just for gender equality, which, um, you know, I feel like in, in conversations about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it, it all gets boiled down into these things, but um, she was she was a hero. She really, really was. She wasn't perfect. Um, you know, she came down on the wrong side of a couple things. She said some things here and there um, that, you know, didn't necessarily equal up to the example she had led or, you know, what what she should maybe should have done, whatever. Um, but she was she was a hero and she's going to go down. If this country has a history going forward, if this country um you know, looks back on this time and is honest and uh, isn't controlled by, you know, neo-fascist and fascist. And if the history isn't written as a way to conceal, you know, what's actually going on, um, she's going to be remembered as a hero. So I, I just want to say that um, she lived a good life uh, to hear the people who were around her. Uh, she was kind she loved people. She gave to them. She supported them. Uh, I, I, I feel like this is one of those things, like if somebody passes away and the people around them are still loyal to them, even after there's nothing more to gain from them, and you know, you hear that there, there was a deep loyalty that was there for a long time, I think that's important. I, I think she lived a good life. I think she was a good person. I think she was heroic. And we're going to talk about her open seat. But before we do, um, I just want to toast uh, to the memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. To a life well lived. Cheers. I, um, you know, it's been a hard thing watching, obviously, the conversation about her being tinged with, you know, this political move or that political move. Um, you know, and on top of that, like, you know, the weird thing about living in this current moment is, you know, everybody gets commodified and, you know, I understand everybody, you know, had this like notorious RBG thing or whatever. And that was actually like a marketing profile that, you know, a lot of people set up and I just don't want it to get lost. 
like what she did and what she fought for. And, you know, I do not think that we would have, and, and this country still has a long way to go in terms of equality. My God, has it got a long way to go. But uh, where it is, a large part of it has to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the work that she did. So before we get to the questions, and people want to know about the Supreme Court, they want to know about the election, they want to know about what's getting ready to happen. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're barreling towards November. But before we do that, I, I want to say a couple of things. This week felt like a punch in the face. This is the feeling that a Trumpian America wants you to have. It's supposed to beat you down. It's supposed to make you feel powerless. It's supposed to make you feel apathetic. It's, the most, it's supposed to make you feel like the odds are continually stacked against you. And as a result, what can you ever do? And it's supposed to promote a moment and a life of nihilism. And that's not what we, we, we have to cling to the idea of hope because one of the things that we have to, um, we have to do here is we can't, we don't need to just get on here every week or whenever we do the thing. If you listen to the Muckrake podcast or, you know, whatever it is, whatever we're doing here, this community that I'm trying to build and you're trying to build and all of that, like it's not enough to get on here and just sort of look at our look at our feet and the ground and just sort of, you know, wallow in it and think that it is over and that, you know, that this is some sort of a eulogy to any possibility of a better future. I feel brutalized in a lot of different ways right now. I um, I'm worried about this country. I'm I'm I don't know how you can look at the Republican Party right now and the blatant hypocrisy. I don't know how you can look at that and not feel frustrated and angry and demoralized. And then you look at the Democratic Party and I don't know what they're necessarily doing. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, we we have to recognize again, and I keep saying this and saying this and saying this, and I'm sorry that if it sounds like a broken record, we have to get educated, we have to get angry, and we have to get organized. And power has to come from us. Because what we're watching right now, and this is one of the things that really upset me. And again, I started this out talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the person, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, a, a hero. We cannot lose sight of people. We can't lose sight of the power that people have. We can't just continually treat this like it's a spectacle, that it's something to watch. Because right now, um, you know, I teach, I teach screenwriting, I teach fiction. Um, you know, you teach in a story that there's like a moment of crisis, right? Where it feels like everything is lost. Um, this feels like we're watching a movie where everything feels lost, right? And the movie does that in order to make you feel like maybe this movie isn't going to have a happy ending and maybe this movie is going to end on a negative note and it prepares you for that. And then that way when the happy ending or the triumph happens, you feel excited and you feel fulfilled from a narrative standpoint. This isn't a movie. This isn't a TV show. This is real life. And what we are dealing with is not something that is an entertainment we're dealing with our futures. We're dealing with the futures of our children, our grandchildren, and generations to come. Uh, this is this is a moment of, of importance. This is a moment of actual importance. And it's not enough to simply say, all is lost. Well, what could I ever do anyway? Because authoritarian societies depend on people feeling demoralized and powerless and apathetic. And we cannot afford to do that. Um, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to find comfort in one another. Um, occasionally, we have to walk away from this thing and find joy. We have to find things that we, we, we enjoy and find inspiration and hope from. I keep saying on here that um, the antidote to fascism is love. We have to find love. We have to find intimacy. We have to take care of one another. We have to build relationships and communities and gain strength from those because it's when we get separated from other people and when we're alone is when we feel the most power, 
the, the, the lack of power. It's when we feel the most fear and the apathy. And at that point, the secret of this society, of an authoritarian society, a fascistic society, is eventually you, maybe you have those rights, right? But then you, you're too afraid to use them. And, and at the end of the day, you just want to be left alone. Like, you, you could destroy me. You could crush me. Just please leave me alone. Whatever. Do whatever you're going to do. Steal whatever you're going to steal. Ruin as many lives as you possibly can. Please just leave me alone. And we cannot let that happen. We cannot let that happen. And um, now is not the time to despair. Now is the time to be angry that this is happening and that that it's being treated the way that it is and that obviously we have uh, a, a political party that isn't a political party. They are a, um, they, it's a fascistic movement that is completely dedicated and obsessed with power. Um, yeah, now's not the time to throw up our hands. Now's the time to fight and fight and fight and fight. And uh, I'll tell you the reason why. Um, Alfonso asked the first question of the night said, will religious fanatics get their wish with the next Supreme Court nominee, or will it be more towards the corporate machine? And here's the bad news. Both. Because what we're facing right now is we are facing a couple of Venn diagrams that come together and they overlap. Um, you know, Trump is a hyper-capitalist, just a complete and utter criminal, obsessed with empowering himself and expediting his profit. He has no ideology beyond uh, being worshipped and making more money and having more power. That's all he cares about. The white identity Christians, uh, Dominionist, who we'll talk about in a little bit, they either want to hasten the end of the world or they want to create a theocratic regime in which they control all of culture and then hasten the end of the world. And then we have white supremacists who have no other intention besides creating either a country that is completely dominated by white people and people of color and vulnerable populations and women uh, have nothing to say about it or live in fear or are done away with in totality. Those different spheres run together at this point. Here's the sad truth, and this is the reason why the Supreme Court pick matters as much as it does. It's not just abortion. Abortion is definitely in trouble, and that is one of the animating, uh, inspiring parts to to the right and, and why they want this so bad. It's also workers' rights. I, I, I By the way, American Rule came out this week. Uh, if you haven't yet, please pick it up. Um, take a look at the Robber Baron Age. <laughs> We live, we live in an echo of the robber baron age where the wealthy and the powerful control not just the economy, but they control politics. Back then, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, it was, it was everyone, children included, being maimed in unsafe working conditions, getting paid absolutely nothing, and being put in danger constantly. That's what they want. And the people that we're talking about, the people who would exploit not just labor, but would put us to work in these terrible conditions, um, it's not enough to simply say, well, look at the, the robber baron age, the gilded age. They're doing it right now in other countries. Corporations that you have their products in your house right now, I do, they're exploiting people around the world. They're running sweatshops. They're engaging in slave labor and, and just massive, massive exploitation. They'll do it here. They'll strike that down left and right. They'll poison our air. They'll poison our water. They'll poison our food. They already are. We're talking about all of that happening in the Supreme Court. We're talking about what little health care and protection that we have being completely struck down. We're talking about every bit of equality for uh, people of color and vulnerable populations and women just being completely stripped bare. Because all of these things are part of the same project. Those hyper-capitalists, those white supremacists, those kleptocrats, they all have the same thing in common. They are engaged in one massive project that is spearheaded by the American right. So whoever gets put in, it's not just one or the other. It's all. What we are fighting 
all that we are fighting is the conflagration of those things all together. So this, what we're looking at with the Supreme Court right now in this fight is it's, it's the, the, the maturation of all of these machinations coming together all at once. That's why it's important. And yes, it's obviously the, the, the biggest thing to talk about is abortion, but it's abortion and everything else. All of these things coming together at once in one nominee, because that's what world the American right lives in. They have an orthodoxy and all of it works together. And all of those things work in concert. It is a well oiled machine with very, very little cleavage between those three groups. Sydney says, my hunch is moderate Republicans like Collins who say they oppose a vote before the election, since that's not their call anyway, will still vote yes when a vote is called, claiming they don't want to punish a qualified justice. So here's a couple things, and this is, I, I think our media has done a um, surprise, surprise, a really piss poor job of, of talking about this, this entire situation. I think there are competing things happening with whether or not this seat gets filled before the election, after the election. I think Donald Trump wants one thing. I think Mitch McConnell and other Republicans want another thing, um, which I don't actually think people have been talking about. For Donald Trump, it is completely in his favor not to get the seat filled before November. Why? Because that would mean that evangelicals and the right have to support him in the election and come out in massive numbers in order to get the judge that they want. That is a card. It, it reminds me um, Blagojevich. It was when, um, you know, he had Barack Obama's Senate seat after Barack Obama won the presidency. And he was like, I'm not going to give this thing away for free, right? Donald Trump person in 